I'm going to talk about one of the few positive things that came out of the financial crisis, and that is the amazing positive productivity shock to fiscal research. In fact, that led me to change the title slightly to the renaissance in fiscal research. And here's a, an example of where necessity is the mother of invention. So just to give you an idea of where fiscal research was, even early in 2008, there were a few of us who were sort of the poor relations of the monetary people uh, doing our research. The people in the US didn't talk very much to the people in Europe who were doing, say, expansionary austerity. Uh, much of our work was using fiscal shocks to try to determine which model of the economy was a better explanation, the neoclassical model or the old Keynesian model. And in fact, uh, a lot of the papers never mentioned the word multiplier. So in Matthew Shapiro's and my 98 paper, we did not mention multiplier. Burnside, Eichen, Bob, and Fisher, no mention of multiplier, all right? Things changed very quickly in fall 2008, and we realized how unprepared we were. And I think that the uh, academic community and policymakers were surprised to find that there really was no consensus and people hadn't been estimating fiscal multipliers. So let me just start by giving you an overview of a lot of the progress we made, and then I will talk about where I think the range of most multipliers is. I'm going to talk about some in the weeds, really important detail about calculating multipliers, and then I'll talk about the fiscal uh, consolidations in Europe and uh, what we might know about the multipliers that apply to the ARRA, and then the tax rebate if I have time. Okay, so we've made progress on all three methodological fronts, lots of progress, okay? And I just put this up here just to give you an idea. So on the theory, and theory is really important because one of the things that theory tells us is that multipliers are going to be really different depending on the financing, whether you have sticky wages and prices, whether you have hand-to-mouth consumers, whether you're at the zero lower bound, you're in a currency union, uh, and whether fiscal policy is anticipated. Also on empirical methods, we imported a lot of the applied micro methods, and so there have been a lot of uh, cross-sectional uh, studies, but also natural experiments, narrative methods, Bartik instruments, uh, proxy SFARs, local projections, all kinds of great new techniques that we use to uh, study fiscal multipliers. And then data, that's also been a really important uh, progress. Newly constructed historical and cross-sectional data sets within countries, narrative instruments for panels of countries, export exploitation, the rich new data created by the variety of policymaker responses to the crisis. So in fact, the crisis in a way created new data for us as well. All right. So I'm going to give you what I see as the current range of the majority of multiplier estimates based on particular circumstances. And let me just overview the scope of the summary that I'm going to give you. First of all, I'm just going to talk about multipliers within the first two to five years. Okay, there's long-run multipliers are also really important, but there are a lot of other issues that come in there. Some of the estimation methods aren't so good for the long run, so I'm just going to look at first, first two to five years. I'm going to look just at industrialized countries. There's all kinds of interesting stuff being done in emerging economies, but you know, I just thought of it as beyond the scope of what I was doing here. Uh, the estimates are based on a variety of methodologies. So it, this is very big tent. I think that all of the methodologies as I talk about in the paper, everyone has a weakness, but they also have some strengths. And so if we use time series methods, cross-sectional methods, estimated DSGE methods, if we're getting similar results, I think that that makes us feel a little bit more confident in them. So, so these include all of these kinds of methods. Um, I am going to exclude some estimates that I think don't use the best practices. And I've had several people email me in the last week, why wasn't my paper included? And, <laughs> and I'll say, you know me, I'm blunt, and I said, you know, the way you calculated your multiplier, I couldn't figure out how to calculate it the right way, and you didn't calculate it the right way. Um, and so, and I'll explain why that's important. But, you know, I'm always open to somebody telling me, no, this really was the best practice, but for this point here. I am excluding some estimates. Now the ranges I'm going to show you are just sort of for the majority of estimates, but that doesn't include some notable outliers. I'll try to mention them as I go just because as you'll see the diagram I had, I just, I initially had a whole bunch of extra arrows and it turned into a mess. So um, there are some notable outliers produced with good methodology. All right. Okay. Multipliers on government purchases, gee, 
Okay, so this is a little line with zero multiplier one, two, and again, this is two to three years. Surprisingly, all right, this is a much more narrow uh, range than I had given in my JEL paper in 2011, all right? 0.6 to 0.8, it's amazing how many estimates for garden variety, on average, over historical samples, uh, multipliers you get. So this is DSGE methods, where you don't have monetary accommodation, time series methods, and a variety of others, although not cross-sectional methods, and I'll show you those in a minute. Uh, aggregate data, many countries, so a lot of this is fiscal consolidations that are mostly spending-based, for example. Uh, this is general government purchases. These are sample averages. Okay. Now, there are a few. So there's one outlier. There's a very nice paper by uh, uh, Ben Zeev and Papa that look at uh, defense news using a really nice uh, uh, restriction, medium horizon restriction. They get as high as 1.5, okay? So there are a few outliers here. Um, also, if you start conditioning on things, so with the Ilziki et al. paper, uh, fixed exchange rates, you tend to get higher multiplier there. But I put that in lighter type because we don't have as many estimates there. So, so the darkness of the type indicates there are lots of estimates piling up there. The lightness of the type that I'm going to show you suggests we, we'd want to look at this some more. Recession versus slack. Okay. So the initial estimates that people like to uh, quote say over two, all right? And this is, you know, uh, Auerbach and Gorodnichenko were the pioneers on this. If you allow for feedback, that falls to 1.5, and if you allow for more complete feedback, it falls even below. And if you have the standard MBR definition of a recession, it actually turns into a negative multiplier during a recession. Okay, so those, what Sarah Zuber and I recently published a paper on this. Uh, we don't say it there, but in a way, that some of the recession multipliers are more fragile than our financial system, okay? So um, those need a little bit more looking. We keep getting 0.6 to 0.8, but there is room for debate. On the other hand, ZLB or monetary accommodation, we're getting ranges that typically are one or above, they can go to three. So we know about the DSGE models that say when you're at the zero lower bound and uh, you don't have monetary, when you have monetary accommodation, that you can get much higher multipliers. There is some fragility there. So some recent papers have found that when uh, the researchers were doing their experiments, they weren't just extending the period of the zero lower bound, they were also extending the persistence of the government spending shock. So, so there's some uncertainty there. But in some samples, so Sarah Zuberi, when we took out World War II, uh, and I, when we took out World War II rationing, we could actually get multipliers around 1.5 during zero lower bound periods or monetary accommodation periods. Uh, in Japan, Miyamoto et al. Uh, have found multipliers on impact are 1.5. If you read closer in the paper, they actually go up to 2.6. So they're finding quite high ones. So there is some evidence of higher multipliers during monetary accommodation, both from the estimated theoretical models, calibrated theoretical models, and time series models. Okay. There's very little work on infrastructure. There was a lot of work in the past uh, that suggested high multipliers. And uh, what I'm, I see from the few more recent ones is that those multipliers can be quite high. And in fact, I have a student working on this and his preliminary multipliers for the US highway system, the original one, are you know, as high as eight. Uh, so I think a lot more needs to be done there, but there's potentially uh, significant multipliers there. Now, in contrast to the time series aggregate data that I showed you in the blue there, the cross-section panel, subnational, general government purchases and transfers, There'll be some outliers using good methodology, but it's surprising how many of these multipliers end up between 1.5 and 2, okay? So people have done it for uh, Italian provinces across the U.S. for prime contracts, and they're getting 1.5 to 2. All right, multipliers on taxes and transfers. Well, David and Christy got amazingly, almost implausibly high in magnitude multipliers of minus two to minus three. And what's really, and that was using narrative identification. And what's amazing is people started taking that methodology to other countries, 
And what do people get? Minus 2.4, minus 2.5, minus 3. And in the fiscal consolidation literature, they find that the consolidations that are mostly tax-based have much higher multipliers than the ones that are mostly spending-based. Okay, so there's quite a, a narrow, relatively narrow range there for tax multipliers. And of course, with tax multipliers, they, they should be negative. Transfers, these should be positive multipliers, tax rebates, okay? If you look at the aggregate data, uh, I could, I'm gonna touch on a little bit of this here but, uh, in my talk, but there's more in the paper. Uh, these tend to be really low. So David and Christy looked at, uh, so Romer's looked at uh, social security transfers, and for the, for the temporary ones, you just didn't get much effect. Uh, other sorts of cases, it's very hard to find in the aggregate data. However, if you look at temporary tax rebates and you look at household level data, estimated MPCs, such as Jonathan Parker's works, and you sort of take them in a partial equilibrium way up to the aggregate, or if you calibrate a DSGE model, that suggests bigger multipliers. Okay, so here's where I'm gonna take you into some really important weeds in the multiplier literature, and this is gonna explain why I have you know, not included some multipliers that were higher that you might have seen. Okay, so a recent lesson learned from the literature is that a really important source of the wide range of multiplier estimates, such as I showed in my JEL piece, is actually due to the simple difference ways that they calculate multipliers. And I'm gonna highlight two commonly used methods that often lead to upward bias, okay? So I'm gonna give you an illustration by just running a, a standard uh, VAR. This is for government purchases multipliers, all right? So it's gonna be a structural VAR. I'm not gonna use my military use. I'm gonna use Blanchard and Parati's identification method. And in their identification method, they're basically assuming that the unforecasted part of government spending in this VAR is the exogenous shock to government spending, all right? So government spending is ordered first. I'm gonna have quarterly data from 1939 to 2015. I include World War II here. I get similar results without World War II. It's just that they're estimated much more precisely with World War II in there. Five variables. I'm gonna have log, you know, the standard thing we do is put things in logs and VARs, right? So log real total government spending per capita, log real GDP per capita, federal tax receipts, three month treasury bill, just to think about interest rates, and, and that goes back to 39, and the inflation rate and four lags quadratic trend, all right. So you estimate these sorts of things and then you say, okay, what happens when an exogenous government shock hits? What happens to the path of government spending and output? Okay, so these are the estimated responses, all right. When the shock happens, using a Blanchard and Parati identification shock, log government spending jumps up, as does log GDP. They follow similar patterns, but something to keep in mind is in many, many of the estimations, and particularly this one, there's a hump shape there. Okay, that's gonna be important. Now we wanna calculate multipliers. We've gotta use those impulse responses. So how do we use the dynamic response of those log variables to answer the question, how much does GDP rise when government spending rises by a dollar? I'm gonna show how seemingly small changes in the method can lead to large changes in the multiplier, all right? So you, you have the estimates already, but you've gotta convert them to multipliers. So as I said, before the financial crisis, we, we didn't really think about multipliers a lot. Blanchard and Parati, they used the word multiplier, but as I will show you, it's really more of a particular description of some impulse responses. So what do they do? Well, they compute the ratio of the log GDP response at horizon H, so that's the red circle, to the impact response of log government spending, all right? So they always keep the impact response of government spending, and they typically look at the peak GDP response to government spending. Um, what I'm gonna show you in the next graph is just doing it for every horizon, but keeping the government spending the same. Now, if you, you probably can't see the numbers, you would say, gosh, that looks like a small multiplier. Well, it's not as small as you might think, and it's because everything is in logs, and therefore percent changes. So what they did, and what I had done in my QJE paper, we said, oh, we know how to convert elasticities. We're just gonna multiply by the sample average of GDP over government spending. It's 4.8 in this sample. So what happens if you do that? 
you get pretty big multipliers, all right? Basically, all you've done is renormalize the GDP response uh, by the, the initial impact in times of 4.8. So when they report a peak multiplier, this is actually higher than what they reported for their particular sample, you get a multiplier above two, all right? Now, the problem with that, and it falls later, the problem with that is, can you imagine if you were a policymaker and you know, they, they undertake this policy thinking they're gonna get a multiplier above two, and then you say, oh, I forgot to tell you, you have to keep spending, government spending, and it's gonna increase, and so the impact on your budget is much bigger than you might think based on this multiplier. So fortunately, Harold Ulig, along with Mountfort, said, you know, we should, calculate multipliers in this dynamic context in a way that reflects the impact on the budget. So what did they do? They compute the ratio of the present value of the cumulative responses. So suppose you want to know the multiplier up at uh, horizon 10. You take the integral under the impulse response of log GDP divided by the integral of the response of government spending, because then that takes into account the dynamic path. Then they also, because everything was in logs, converted it uh, to dollar multipliers, uh, as with the previous method. So what happens when you calculate the multiplier this way at each horizon? Whew. Suddenly, that multiplier of two you know, is below one, and uh, the only time the multipliers are the same is, of course, on impact. And this one that's allowing for the total effect on government spending is telling you that multiplier on average is below one, although it looks like it might go up a little bit above one past 15 quarters, all right? So a lot of the big multipliers you've seen, and, and they're still being used in some published papers in good places, I won't mention it, <laughs> um, are because they're calculating that Blanchard and Parati way of doing things. Now, that's not the only thing, although that's the biggest thing. And it, it depends on the sample, you know, what, how much of a hump there is in your impulse response. Now, as I said, we all use logs, because that's what you do in a VAR, but then that gives you elasticities, not multipliers. And as I said, we would just multiply by the sample average of y over g. But, and Bob Hall, he kept saying, you shouldn't use logs. And I said, oh, well, I know how to convert things because he and uh, Barrow and Redlick hadn't run VARs and they were just running things uh, transformed in a way. So there's one way to transform it the way they did it. An easier way is Gordon and Cren, where you just divide both output and government spending by some measure of potential GDP or polynomial, you know, some polynomial trend. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna re-estimate that model using the gordon Cren transformation because then I don't have to use an ad hoc conversion factor. What happens there? So that's the blue line, all right? Multipliers go down even more in this particular sample. And if I, I found that in a number of samples. So they're more 0 0.7, 0 0.5. And this actually solves a puzzle I had because in my QJE paper, I used that ad hoc conversion factor like everybody else, and I was getting multipliers slightly above one. And then I was surprised in a follow-up paper in NBR fiscal volume, I was looking at private spending, and I was finding that private spending decreased significantly. Well, that doesn't make sense. If the multiplier is above one, private spending shouldn't be going down. And then it was later when I was working with Mike Aoyang and Sarah Zuberi on some historical data where uh, the ratio of GDP to government spending varied a lot that I realized that this ad hoc conversion factor we were all using um, wasn't the right way to go. Now, there's also an additional issue for tax multipliers, which is most tax multipliers reported are based on the legislative forecast of the budget impact, not taking into account dynamic feedback, okay? But tax cuts raise GDP. That's what all of these find with that big, uh, uh, you know, minus two to minus three multiplier, which mitigates the negative effect of the tax cut on tax revenue. So tax multipliers are even greater in magnitude if reported relative to the actual change. Most of what I'm showing you are not reported relative to the actual change. There's actually one good reason that a lot of people don't like to report that is some tax changes seem to be at the top of the Laffer curve, and so there's zero change in tax revenue, and it's really hard to divide by zero. So. All right, bottom line, many of the big differences that I wasn't aware of back in 2011 are not due to the estimation method, the sample, it's just 
the way we were computing multipliers, because you know nobody talked about multipliers for the most part, you know, since the 60s, and so we had to catch up on sort of standardizing the method and figuring out that these small changes have big effects. Okay, so that was important for me to say, so you can understand why I don't include you know every single study when I talk about uh, the European fiscal consolidation or uh, uh, the ARRA. So I'm going to be a little bit brief here, in part because uh, my discussants can talk a lot about it. Plus, uh, uh, this is for the JEP, and one of the other papers in there is going to be talking more about Europe. OK, so as you know, in the wake of the financial crisis, numerous European countries undertook fiscal consolidations. And uh, some were more spending-based, and some were more tax-based. And remember, those multipliers can be really different. Studies using narrative evidence for identification find that, on average, tax-based consolidations have much larger output effects than spending-based consolidations, and these are consistent with the US findings. Now, we still have a reason to believe that the multipliers were bigger in general during the European consolidation. So uh, one possibility is because interest rates were near the zero lower bound, and we do have some evidence the multipliers could be bigger then. So uh, in a forthcoming book, Alessino Favero and Giovazzi find that once they control for tax versus spending features, multipliers in the wake of the financial crisis are not different from those on average. However, there's some really interesting indirect evidence from Blanchard and Lee and House Probsting and TSAR, which suggests that may, multipliers were bigger than people thought they were at the time. So particularly with uh, the Blanchard and Lee, they show, they, they regress forecast errors of GDP on uh, the forecasted, not the forecast error, the forecast of the fiscal consolidation. And they find that it's significant, so there was a bias in the forecast of GDP that was linked with the size of the fiscal consolidation. Now, as they say, this is just an indirect way. They can't exactly back out the multiplier, but it suggests that whatever was in those models back then uh, was uh, not high enough. Okay, so let me talk about multipliers during the ARRA. All right, as I said, it, it was possible that they were higher because we were at the zero lower bound. Uh, the cross-state estimates of the impact suggest big employment and output multipliers, and Gabe Chowderoy Reich has a really nice forthcoming paper that sort of standardizes and synthesizes the ARRA evidence, and he estimates multipliers from 1.7 to 2 on output, or two job years created per 100,000, okay? Something else that he found is once he standardized these estimates, this huge range you had seen before suddenly became much more narrow, okay? So, so standardization has been really good for the fiscal literature. Now, caveats. Fiscal literature is known for a long time. Subnational multipliers are not necessarily the same as aggregate multipliers. However, uh, Chaudhary Reich uses theoretical arguments from Farhi and Warning to argue that at the CLB, the cross-state multipliers for externally financed spending are lower bounds than the aggregate multiplier. So then this leaves us with the question, why are the cross-state multipliers so much higher than those estimated using aggregate data? And if you want to see how high they are, this is a counterfactual that I put together that says, what would have happened, given his estimates, what would have happened to the unemployment rate had there been no ARRA? And this is for 2009 to 2011. And uh, my paper has more details on how I did this, but it says that the unemployment rate would have risen above 15% had there been no ARRA. And so this is even with all of the monetary things going on, TARP and all of that, all right? So it's a big number. So Gabe and I are still debating this. Uh, I think that the existing ARRA multipliers don't apply to the aggregate, okay? And here's the reason. They're not nationally representative. The ARRA studies, none of them weighted. They use per capita variables by state, but they don't weight their regressions by state population. That means that North Dakota is given the same weight as California. If treatment effects are heterogeneous across states, then the unweighted estimates won't be nationally representative. Also, it doesn't account for all of government spending. Much of the ARRA consists of federal transfers to states, and several studies have found a flypaper effect that there was induced state spending of more than one for one. <laughs> 
So what happens if we correct the estimates? So Gabe has wonderful replication files. I re-estimated his model, but I weight each state by population, and I use total state and local induced spending. These estimates are for job years per $100,000, but it's approximately equal to the output multiplier given his conversions, all right? First column is his headline estimate, 2.0, with a robust standard error, 0.59. If I use his same model, but then just weight by population, the estimate falls to 1.15, but bigger standard error, 0.72. To be clear, you know, these confidence bands are overlapping each other. If I take all the government spending and then also weight by population, I get 0.89, with somewhat smaller standard error. But again, they all could be one. All right, but it's just something to think about, and it's, it's amazing how much information people doing the ARA research got from 50 states, but you have to understand that 50 states are only 50 states, and so there's a question about which is the nationally representative uh, estimate. All right, I'm going to, I, yeah. So, conclusions, I'm not gonna talk about the tax rebate 2008. There really has been a renaissance in fiscal research, so this is a really good thing that came out of the financial crisis, and, and it's not going to go away like maybe some of the other regulations. Um, <laughs> we now know much more than we did 10 years ago. Uh, garden variety, government purchases multipliers are probably between 0.6 and 1, though there are some credible estimates, you know, above 1. 1.5, you know, there, there are some estimates there that I, that seem to use the best practices. Tax rate change multipliers are probably minus two to minus three. I initially said, this is just too high. I went through all their programs, could not knock those down. Um, multipliers on infrastructure and during periods of monetary accommodation are probably above one, possibly substantially above one, but more research should be done to assess the robustness. All right, thanks. <laughs>